As we've been reporting, Governor Healy announces the state's public health emergency for COVID-19 will now end May 11th. Here to answer questions is Dr. Daniel Kritzkis, Chief of Infectious Diseases at the Brigham. Dr. Kritzkis, thanks for being here. Nice to be here with you, Erica and Ben. All right, Dr. Kritzkis, as you well know, May 11th is the same day that the federal public health emergency is scheduled to end. So what in practicality does that mean for a hospital like yours? And would patients notice any change if they walk in the door on May 12th? I don't think much is going to change for our patients. I think we're still going to be continuing to mask as a precaution and, you know, our operations aren't going to change very much. What is going to change, though, is what might be available through the federal government and potentially the state government in terms of support for access to various sorts of COVID related care. Uh, and that is a concern. There's also an issue about what happens to all these drugs that are uh, authorized under an emergency use authorization when an emergency is no longer in, in existence. Uh, they'll need full approval instead. Hmm. Yeah, so you're talking about the tools we now have to manage this virus. The governor says we now have many. So do you agree? I mean, you were just saying we should see some changes in terms of approvals and things to, so people can use them. Well, we, we certainly have a, a whole variety of tools, starting with vaccination and then, of course, the, the drugs that we have to treat people uh, who are symptomatic and outpatient and at risk of severe disease or people who actually get admitted to the hospital. We have many, many ways of being able to deal with COVID, although preventing COVID is still the best approach. Well, as you know, Massachusetts has one of the highest vaccination rates uh, for COVID-19 in the country, yet only 80 percent are fully vaccinated here in the Bay State. Within that group, just six 62% have received at least one booster shot. Do you see those numbers at this point now really here? What two years after vaccines first became available, really getting any higher or have we kind of reached the limit? Well, I hope those numbers will increase because I, I think we still need to persist at educating and convincing people that getting vaccinated is in their best interest. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and speaking of those who have not been vaccinated at all, Massachusetts still has 7% of residents who are in that category, not a single COVID shot. Most are younger than 20, some though are older. In your opinion, do those people have a lower risk now of serious illness or death from COVID, maybe because the, the strains have changed even though they're unvaccinated because it's less severe? Is there any truth to that? So I think people clearly have a lower risk of becoming infected just because there's so much less COVID circulating. But I don't think that the risk of severe disease, if you happen to be somebody who has a risk factor for severe disease, and even if younger, that could mean because you have a coexisting medical condition like diabetes or asthma or or other or you're overweight. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about whether the Omicron variants were uh, less uh, virulent than earlier ones, and there's no clear uh, evidence for that being the case in Hong Kong, where people were largely unvaccinated when Omicron went through, there were high rates of, of mortality among the elderly. So I don't think we can really count on this being a less virulent virus at the present time. Hmm. Interesting. All right, Dr. Daniel Kriskis, uh, so much to talk about there today. We appreciate your expertise and your insight. Thanks very much. Thanks, doctor.